um, they look pretty good. I'm going to, I'll have them, you know, comments and things back to you via Canvas um, by Friday, hopefully, in a week's time. The um, one thing that my students have had trouble with in the past, uh, Canvas has a feature where I can, like, comment on the PDF, and then from your view, it's sometimes hard to see those comments or, or understand they're there. And I can't remember the exact detail because I never see it as the student view, but uh, there will be comments in them. So you want to um, try, click download the PDF or something, and it should, it should give them to you. If you have trouble, let me know. Chris? Yeah, uh, it, sh it does, but I think it's buried in the interface. And um, in one, did you do that in 150A? In my one you were in my last year's 150A, right? Or the year before? Last year's. We were using Canvas? Or not? I can't remember either. Well, they changed the whole um, grading thing in Canvas over the summer, so maybe it's better now. Uh, anyways, if you can't find the comments, um, ask a friend or ask me, and we'll figure it out. So that'll be that. The other thing is, is that we are. Uh, this is week four, basically, and um, we're we're pretty much on schedule here in terms of what I had hoped last time. So this is the twenty Monday, the twenty third. And we will talk, we will finish talking about generalized speeds and introduce partial velocities. And that is essentially the end of chapter two. All right. Um, and then we will start in to um, inertia, forces, and then after Thanksgiving, um, uh, more special topics and things. Uh, but the key thing here is that an exam on chapters one and two. And I'm going, um, <clears throat> I'd written in the syllabus that I was going to give uh, take home exams. How many of you prefer a probably l longer, um, maybe harder take home exam versus a shorter in class exam? Two prefer take home, three prefer take home, four? How many prefer five? How many prefer in-class exams? One, two. All right, we'll stick with what I got. What I'm going to do then is um, <clears throat> we'll use Wednesday to uh, probably <coughs> finish up a little bit about partial velocities in the, some of the last bit. And then uh, the second half of Wednesday, at least, will be review. So you guys should bring your questions um, on the homework problems, whatever you're having trouble uh, figuring out. And we will we will discuss those. And if you, and if you don't have questions, I'll just I'll go over some things too. And then I, I will um, I'm going to give you an, I'll give you the exam Wednesday, and I think I'm going to make it due Monday. All right, and it will um, likely have a few sort of opened in pro, open ended problems. They'll be similar to the kind of problems that you're doing in the homework problem sets. And um, I think too. Um, I'm going to um, give it via the Jupyter Hub. So in, in my, um, in my uh, 122 class, we've been using, uh, we create homework assignments. And then, um, here, I, I can just show you so you can see what, what to expect here. Um, if I go, go into Bicycle, and you probably no, noticed, might have noticed these tabs up here, but if I click Assignments, right, here's a homework assignment for my other class. I can fetch it. And then if I come to, back to my files and refresh, and I go to that homework three that I just fetched, there's an IPython notebook there. And I open this up, and it has text and things, and like, you're supposed to type your answers here, right? And some of them you might have to type, you might have to type some text like this, 
for your answer, or you might have to write a little code that displays the um, answer. Okay? So I think the exam is going to be in this, this format. I'm going to uh, create one of these that will have problems that you have to solve. Okay? And, um, and I'll share the, and have the instructions written out for uh, my other class. I'll share those. Chris? So you want all of our solutions via Jupyter? All of the solutions via Jupyter. You can double, you can double check them by hand and, and things if you want to do that. If you want to add an image in, you can, you know, um, you can take an image of some handwritten sketch if you need, like, if I, if I ask, show me a free body diagram of this thing. And then you can um, paste it in there. Um, it's not pa pasting, but you can uh, use the markdown format that inserts the image. Okay? But it'll mostly be, um, I, I think, at least 90% of it will like, likely be use, um, use SimPy mechanics to solve a kind of problem that you're doing now. Okay? So I'm going to give it in that form. The other thing is uh, it will be, um, you can use anything you want. Um, you know, any resources except people, okay? Um, no talking to anybody in class, nobody, no asking questions on forums, nothing, right? You can't converse with a person. And that's, my, that's my rule. So we'll, we'll do it that way, but you guys have to honor that for me, all right? And then you'll have uh, till Monday um, before class to finish it. Any other questions on that, Chris? If we used, I mean, in an 158 class interpreting some of the problems was uh, a difficulty for me, I don't know about other students, but we can ask you questions. Yes, you can ask me questions to clarify the exams. Okay. But I, I will, uh, just like I would in a in-class exam, I'm not going to give you, I'll be limited on the information I give you, but I will clarify questions. Right, and you should just... Um, Email me, or I, th I think in Piazza you can do a private note to, to private question. Um, so either of those formats. And, and in fact, if it's just a clarifying question, um, you can ask publicly on, on Piazza. And, and, um, uh, but do not share any you know, uh, part of your solution or anything. Right? You're, not, you're not supposed to share anything. Like that. But if you need a clarifying question, you can ask it publicly on Piazza, and I will um, answer um, as fast as I can. Any other questions on what that would be? Okay, so I'll have that ready for you um, to give to you at the end of the class of Wednesday. All right. Um, so that's that was that. In those exams, if uh, you recall my syllabus two. The project's going to be worth 40%, and the exam, each exam will be worth um, 30%. Right? Two 30% exams, one 40% project. Okay. All right, so this is what we ended with last time. Um, we were talking about motion constraints. And if you have motion constraints. These are uh, functions that relate some of the generalized speeds to the other generalized speeds. Right? And you as the modeler will get to choose which one of those you want to be the dependent ones and which one you want to be the in independent, independent ones. But in general, we're going to deal with constraints like this that relate the dependent generalized speeds to the independent generalized speeds in some linear fashion. Okay? So these are just linear coefficients, and, um, and it may be a function of you know, multiple uh, generalized speeds. There's only p of them, okay? because um, we eliminate some of them with m motion constraints. Any questions here, Chris? You said these are coefficients. Well, th this form is, this is not a matrix. This is a scalar, a scalar, scalar, scalar. 
right? If I plug in, so this tells me the rth, you know, the, the uh, rth generalized speed is a function of the sum of a bunch of other generalized speeds. So these are just coefficients. You could also write this as um, u r, and I'll make it a vector now, so we know that it's a, like a column vector. And then I could write something like, um, I'll use that for a matrix. Right, matrix form. So this, this equation is basically giving you one row of that, that matrix form. And you can do that, that same form with, uh, with the kinematical differential equations. Too. Okay, so that's where we left off there. Other questions on motion constraints? What is a motion constraint? Anybody, can anybody put that into words? Like, conceptually? What's a configuration constraint? And it, sort of just conceptually, what, what is that? Chris? A position limiter. Yeah, that's a reasonable way to um, state it, right? It, it um, will f enforce that the position of something will be uh, in uh, some, some, it will be in some configuration or some position. It will enforce that the position is some value of something in your system. Yeah? Any other ways to put that, a configuration constraint? What's an example of a configuration constraint? Can you think of a system that has a configuration constraint that you've seen? Yeah, so that, um, I haven't precisely talked about that yet, but I, I have a, a, a limit in the angle that I can go. So we have sort of an inequality constraint here that says theta, the angle of my knee, can't go past some value in one direction, can't go past value in the other direction. And so those are, those are effectively configuration constraints. Um, but as long as I s stay in this regime, I don't have any. There's no, no constraints on my motion. It's only when I hit these extrema. So that's not a, that is a, uh, I don't think I would, uh, I would call those bounds on the motion. And they um, are only configuration constraints um, with a certain criteria. So, so they are a form of one. What, what's one that, that, that uh, isn't just a bound on the motion? Does this have a configuration constraint? It's two-dimensional, right? If I let it do this, right, it has no, no configuration constraints. But if I say it's stuck to the table, right, basically the um, coordinate that would define its position and the ones that would define its angle relative to the table plane have to be zero, right? So those are configuration constraints. So that's, that's a very simple one. How many people have um, done the four-bar linkage problem in a dynamics class? Know what a four-bar linkage is? Seen that kind of thing? 
maybe? Where might you see a linkage like that? Maybe I should draw it more like... Uh, Little arm. What might that model? Can you think of a real system that might, that might model? We could apply a omega or something to to this little short linkage. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a good one. Right, if I have a train wheel, right, and one's the driving wheel, right, this is the only one that gets power to it. If I connect these two wheels like so, they're going along the track, um, I basically have a four bar linkage here. And that is going to rotate about sorry, the center of the wheels. Right? So if I put a link to the center each of each wheel and let that train go, and, the, and these links were glued to the wheel, put a little. Right, I, have a, I have a four bar linkage there. And the reason it's called four bar one, two, three. We consider the ground the fourth, fourth bar. And then here's one, two, three, but the train axle, you know, those axles are connected to each other, so there's a fourth bar back there, too. Does this have a configuration constraint? Say it again. So the angle of the wheels. If I look at some angle here, and these were my generalized coordinates, yeah, those are going to have to be the same. So that you could write it in terms of those angles that uh, they w those would have to be the same. Another way to look at it is. Uh, if I draw the linkage like this, not connected, I call that P and this O and this Q, the position vector from P with respect to O must equal what? for that four bar linkage to be a four bar linkage. Yes. Right? That's a configuration constraint. If I say that these have to be the same, putting P where Q is, then R is some function of just the just the Qs, however we find it. Maybe we had uh, theta, alpha, and gamma, right? So I can write the position vector from O to P in terms of theta, gamma, and alpha, and the lengths of those arms. And then if I know the length from here to here, then I can make that equation. And I have something that constrains Right, that is three angles, three Qs, and we'll get a configuration constraint here. How many, how many configuration constraints will come out of that equation? Maybe first, how many degrees of freedom does this have? Just, just thinking about it, can you uh, what does it seem, how many degrees of freedom does it seem like it has?
If I put this bar at different angles, can the angles of these bars be anything but a, but a specific value? No. No. Right, if I rotate this and I hold that, hold that bar still, it's impossible for me to move, move the other bars. Right? So I've constrained its configuration by locking that single coordinate. Right? So I claim this has one degree of freedom. Here we have three Qs, right? N equals three. Or, or, or coordinates, N equals three. How many constraints must that equation have then? Two. Right? Right, so n is 3 must minus m, the number of constraints, must be, uh, and I'm getting confused, I'm, talking, I'm using the numbers for motion constraints, but um, n is typically the minimal set. And they use, ca he, uh, in the book they use um, capital N as the non-minimal set of generalized coordinates. So if I have uh, three coordinates here, and two constraints are going to be there, I've got an x and a y position of that vector. So I'll get two scalar equations. And that will leave me with one configuration variable. So n, little n, equals 1 for this system. All right, one generalized coordinate. All right, so that, that is a, a configuration constraint. Also, very common. Questions on that? I feel like you guys weren't getting that. Yeah? It, it I guess what I'm having trouble understanding is, is this just an abstraction of certain things we've already done anyway? Like, this kind of problem is something we're doing 102, but we never looked at it in terms of configuration constraints. So is it just a... It, in 102, you sort of aren't, you aren't explicit about this. Right. Right. And you may not you may not need to be because it's a simple problem. Um, but once you if you made this a three dimensional multi link thing, it's not so obvious what the configuration constraints become. So you want to uh, think about them more carefully. I think as you're as you're drafting your uh, problem. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Just it's an explicit way. It's still a configuration constraint, constraint in 102, even though they don't call it that then. And they may, and depending on the book, um, they probably use the word constraint. You still have to, right, you have to solve that constraint to solve the problem. There's no way, no ifs, ands, or buts about that. And, uh, and they also do talk about that being a one degree of freedom system in a, in a 102 in a dynamic, first dynamics class. Other questions? All right, so that's a configuration constraint. And then motion constraints, what was an example of a motion constraint that we looked at last time? The ice skate. So if I had an ice skate on this plane, we decided to say that um, if I move forward in the direction of the skate, um, I'm sorry. That's not exactly what I want to say. It. Say this is pin is my velocity vector of the escape. Um, we're gonna what we constrained was that the velocity vector always has to be in line with the skate. So if the skate moves laterally, it must move forward some too, right? If it has some lateral velocity. It's going to have to have some forward velocity. It can never have one without the other. And so that constrains its motion to be. A certain, um, a certain motion, All right? And then let's look at a new example now, just to like go over that a bit more. Okay. So what I want to do now, I'm going to sketch out a little system here that, and then we're going to jump over to um, SymPy to solve that system, OK? All 
All right, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have a simple trailer. A single wheel that rolls without slip. On the A one A two plane, and I will create a plane here. So set up a coordinate system. I'm going to call this A1, this A2, and this A3. And this trailer is going to look like this. It'll have a hitch that's in the plane A a1, A2. Located at P. And we're going to move that hitch P around. And then it's got sort of a body that looks like this. We've got a single wheel I discovered that this surface that I bought it has this like you can't see it, but um, on the screen, it, the pin sticks, and there's like this blob of something on it. I'm going to have to send it back, I think. And uh, it's, it's weird. Uh, and I was hitting it on there, hitting it that blob on the wheel, on the, drawing the wheel right there. Okay? So we've got a hitch here, uh, a disc, and I'm going to call um, the disc body D, right? We'll call this frame of sorts. Um, e, and add a few dimensions to it. So the disk has a radius, big R, and this dimension is going to be H plus R. And the trailer is going to have a length, L. Right? And this disc rolls without slip on the plane A2. A1. And this um, point P, we are going to direct it using um, a vector. And I'll use uh, red. So if I draw a line from this origin here, and I create a n hat vector, the distance in the direction n to the point we're going to call q1. Right, a time varying variable. And um, <coughs> this angle between n and the, and the trailer, projection of the trailer frame into the ground, we'll call Q2, the second generalized coordinate. And then one more generalized coordinate. If I fix a line on D, 
and measure the angle between the frame, call that Q3. All right, <clears throat> the uh, trailer always stays vertical, um, normal to the plane. Right? Those, these uh, blue lines are always normal to the plane. The re wheel rolls without slip on the plane. And depending on whatever direction in is in hat, we can pull that hitch and the trailer will follow. OK? Any questions on that figure? And I want to label some more points. Um, I'll use blue. We'll call um, this point Q. We'll call the center of the wheel O. And then we're also going to have a, con a point that's always at the contact point, and we'll call that S. Is that everything? Yep, I think that's everything. Questions on that? Okay, so this is a non-trivial example here. Um, what I'm going to do is... I'm gonna, oh, oh, yeah, this thing was... This thing never stays connected to the Internet. Um, I wanted to show the picture. And the thing. Let me let me try to connect to the internet real quick. I got an insanely long passphrase. But, uh, oh yeah. Sorry about this. Now it won't give me the log the login screen. Does anybody know how to do that? No one does. Like it was giving me a, it was asking me for my password, name and password. Now it's not. Uh, I hate this thing. There it is. I don't know why it popped up there. J K M O R. All right, I think I'm live. Okay, so let's slide this to the side. And then um, Firefox to this side. Okay, so go ahead and open up your computer to follow along with me here. And uh, let's see. Anybody know how to make a, a window overlap another one without it moving? Okay. 
should work. Okay, so open up a new notebook. After all kinds of difficulties, and um, make this a little bigger. Okay. Standard imports here. Import simpy as sm. And then import simpy to physics to mechanics is me. And then I'll turn on the init v printing. All right. So, um, <coughs> First thing I'm going to do, I want to introduce some dynamic symbols for these three generalized coordinates that we have. Okay, so these are our time varying coordinates. And then we've got some non time varying um, variables there too L, H, and R. So I'll use just um, the symbols function to make those. And the pattern that I usually follow is uh, create reference frames, orient them relative to each other, set their angular, angular velocities, and then use those reference frames to define points and figure out their linear velocities. All right? So we're going to try to find um, the velocities of the important port, port points here. In particular, um, that point S, the contact point, right? So I'm going to call the, um, we've got the background frame, call that reference frame A. And then a reference frame N. And um, notice here that I am not, I'm actually not going to orient N relative to A. I have no information. I didn't provide any information here about the angle of N with respect to A. Okay, but A is the inertial reference frame. Um, N, N moves with time, potentially. Okay, so I'm just going to create those. And then I'm going to, starting with the N frame, uh, create uh, the new frame, the e extra frame. So we'll say that E equals uh, N.orient. new. We'll name it E. I'll do a simple axis rotation. We need the angle. So the angle between E and N, and I didn't quite add, uh, I wanted E to be the direction that I want it. E1 this direction. E three that way, and E two that way. Okay, so E one points from where O is back towards the P and Q area. So the angle here is Q two, and the rotation is going to be about the if we call in, we can just say that this in, we're going to, I'm going to make that in x. And then in z will be the same as a2, a3. So I'm going to rotate um, about a negative in z here. And that's the same as a3. So that, that'll set that 
Q2 orientation. And then we've got one more body, D, one more reference frame, that's relative to E. And D has a simple rotation. And that's just too small. Go ahead and um, fill out what that should be. And I'll try to increase this a little for you. Is that visible? So E2 is the, it points a, along the axis of the disk, this direction. And then this is Q3 here, which gives an orientation of D relative to E. What would the what would the values be for that rotation, that orientation specification? Q three E dot Y. How many people agree with that? Good. All right. So now we've specified the orientation of all the frames we have there. <coughs> except for the one between A and N, because I gave you no information about that. So there, that's the orientations. Now we can set um, angular velocities. Okay, And if we have orientations set between different frames, like these two, um, it will automatically compute those orientations, I mean those angular velocities. But here, um, we don't have that luxury. So, oh, and I forgot to say that, uh, I said that incorrectly earlier. N is fixed in A. That, that's one key thing. N is fixed in A at some arbitrary angle. Um, it, it isn't moving, uh, but point P moves along, along N. So I think I said that mis mis incorrectly earlier. So we can uh, first check a few things. Like if I do a D dot angular velocity in E, for example, returns what we, ex ex what we expect, uh, Q3 dot in the EY direction. I can even, I could ask for uh, E dot angular velocity in N. And that's negative Q2 dot in the NZ direction. Right? Well, we need to set the angular velocity of N and A. So we can use the set angular velocity in the reference frame A to what value? Based on what I just said. Zero. In the in frame is just fixed at arbitrary angle in A. So we're going to set that to zero. And then if I ask for it, it would have given me an error if I had asked for, tried to ask for it before setting it. You could you could try that to verify. All right. So now I've set 
I have some angular velocities, and then I can, uh, you know, do things from d dot angular velocity and n, or all the way back to a, and it'll use that addition theorem for angular velocities and, and do that addition for me. Right. So I have the angular velocity set. Now we want to start to um, set some points. And I forgot to add one point on here. I'm going to call this origin uh, capital M. And we'll start with that. So M equals ME dot point M. And then we've got some other points, but I'm going to um, locate them. So I want to create point P. And I need a position from M to P. And I said that uh, we'll use NX as our N hat. And this is Q1 times NX. So use that same notation there to locate Q, O, and then S. Okay, and you can build off previous, you know, if I've set, if I've got this vector, well, I could just then find this vector, or you can start here and do the whole thing, however you want to do it. But um, find, go ahead and set the the um, positions of P. I mean, sorry, Q, O, and S. Okay. Take a few minutes on that. How many people got Q? Mr. Q?
H is a scalar. R is a scalar. Mm -hmm. E is a vector. E, is a, e dot Z is a vector. So you're trying to add a scalar to a vector there. How many people got Q? How many people got O? And S? Okay, most. Just take one more minute. Try to get get all the way to S there. You can chat with your neighbor if you're having trouble. Saw at least one uh, error message so far. Okay, how could I fill out my Q designation here? What would be the vector from P to Q? That told me you had it. Easy? That was easy. Anybody know why I got this? This is the type error. I saw this error. If I scroll down, it says a vector must be supplied. What's wrong with this statement? Yeah, H is a scalar, R is a scalar, E, Z is a vector. And so it tries to, order of operations is, it'll do the R, E, Z first, right? because it's multiplication. And then we have a vector plus a scalar. So fix for that is, you can do that, put it in parentheses. Next point is O equals, I'll locate it from Q. What should this be? Negative L times EX. Yep. So that'll walk us. So here we went in the E, the E, Z. I guess we should, so it's sort of unfortunate. We, um, it's a limitation of Python. We can't type ones and twos um, as the dot, dot. So we have to use Z. But anyways, it's EZ, negative EX. And then... Uh, we got one more. Yeah, to get, get all the way to O. Did I not let you finish? Uh, uh, minus, H. minus H times EZ. So then back down. So we went L in the EX and then H in the E, uh, negative EZ. All right. And we can look at those. Um, Let's look, look at, uh, let's just go O position from M all the way back. Right now I can see that um, if I start at M, I get Q1 in the NX and then um, negative L, I mean uh, R in the EZ will take me up to here. And then negative L in the EZ will walk me over here. So it canceled out the two H's that were in the two expressions for us automatically. Simpy does a few very simple ca uh, cancellations like that automatically, but most of the time it doesn't. All right, so that gets us down to O. Um, finally, S. What should I locate S with respect to? Which other point? 
Go from P. And what should that vector be? So if I'm at P, and I want to go here to S, Chris, you said to start from P. Negative L E X. How many people chose that? A few. E, point S, if you recall from last time, is this point that we say is fixed in D, but always at the contact point. Remember that? Fixed in D, it's a point fixed in D, but it happens to be at any time instant where the wheel touches the ground. And we talked about the ro you know, this rolling motion last time. With that in mind, do you think this definition of S is going to be useful in the way we might um, need it to move further on? What are we going to use that point S for first, I guess? A motion constraint, right? We have this rolling without slip. And uh, any time you hear that, you, you're likely going to have a motion. You're going to have a motion constraint. Okay, that, that's, that's the basics of that. So we want to know that velocity of s in the m frame or the n frame, either one. Um, with respect to one of the non-moving frames, and then we want to we're going to want to set those that to zero because we're going to say it's not going to slip in that direction or that direction. So we want to get the velocity of s. If I uh, <clears throat> calculated the velocity of s of this expression, I'd get L uh, times q2 dot would give me the lateral velocity with respect to p of that. <clears throat> and there's no q3 in that, ex in that expression. Right? If, I, if I wanted the velocity of s with respect to p, and I differentiate that there in the in frame, I get um, L Q2 dot in the E Y direction, right? So if I look at the, the velocity of this thing, that point is moving in the E2 direction, and Q2 makes it do that. So that would be the only, we, we could do that. Let's just set that velocity instead of me faking it. Let's use that expression. And then we know that we can take the time derivative of s in a frame. I'm going to take it in in the in frame. I'm oh, sorry. s uh, dot position from, let's go from uh, p, and then dot dt in the in frame. It only contains Q2 dot. Does that seem right? Should it, should it have any other Q dots in there? The velocity of a point S fixed in D?
What if, uh, what if there were no ground and this wheel was just, just spinning? Right? And it's not touching the ground. What Q dots would the velocity of S and D be a function of? If, if it was just sort of a wheel rotating with this Q3 angle in space, what Q dots would uh, the velocity of S? Let me put it another way. Say if I had a uh, point here, I'll call it, it lets me draw. point here, let's call it S prime, and say that that is fixed on this line, right? I've, I've got a line drawn on the disk. S prime is right there on that line I've drawn on the disk. What, what Q dots do you think S would be, this S prime would be in a, as a function, um, if I, if I uh, found this velocity relative to P, with respect to the end frame, you can, and it can still be touching the ground there. So S is this point glued on the wheel, and it rotates with the wheel. What, what Q's, what would that, uh, what Q dots would be in the velocity expression? Hmm? All of them. Yeah? How many people think it would be all of them? Josh? Jill? I mean, Jess? I, Chris? And why do, the people that don't raise their hand, why, do you, why does it not, why do you, uh, why does it seem like, what do you think? How, what, what, which ones should it be a function of? So we definitely know that P is this function of Q1, if I, right? And then we'd agree that O is a function of Q1. The velocity of O is a function of Q1 and Q2. Raise your hand if you believe that. So everybody believes that. And then I have one more rigid body, and there's this point S prime stuck on the wheel, and it's moving around with the wheel. Would I have to include an, a Q3 dot to get that? Yes. Right. Now, if I say, well, let's think about S. It's still a point fixed on the disk, right? Just like this one's fixed on the disk, except we're only thinking about, we're sort of changing the point every instant of time. You know, this point here moved to here, and, and now we're thinking about that point in the disk, okay? So it's the point that is at the contact point, but it's fixed in the disk at any given point in time. So we're basically sort of sampling all the points on the disk as it rotates. And we're just grabbing that point, snapshot in time, looking at the point that's fixed in the disk that happens to be at the contact point. And then asking ourselves, what Q's or Q dots would that be a function of? Would it be a function of Q1? Got a couple knots. How many people think it would be a function of Q1? You're just raising your hand because you know I want you to. How many think that this would be a function of Q1 and Q2? And then how many think that it would also be a function of Q3? Still not sure. So let's talk about this. This is like one of the hard part. This is a hard thing to get your head wrapped around. I, I, I remember struggling with it. And the key thing is, uh, what, can I, what can I do? Does anybody think they understand it? Chris, do you want to say what you think? 
put in some of the words? Let's not talk about the motion constraint yet. I don't want to get into that. I just, wanted to, I just want us to believe we know what the velocity of this point S is first. And then we can talk about the motion constraint. Here's one way to think about it. I'm going to try, try this, OK? I can draw, I can fix lots of points, right? This. I'm going to call this point 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, seven, right? And this thing's spinning. And that's a function of time, OK? And you can tell me the uh, all these have a tangential velocity, right? If I take a snapshot in time, and the center of this has omega over r, if this is r, right? Each one of these points has a velocity. These velocities are with respect to the center. And then I add whatever velocity the center of the Right, we, we agreed on this last time. So this would have 2v up here. This point would have 0. And, and this point would have a velocity that would be the sum of those two, right? Some of these two, some of these two. So if I take a snapshot in time, and I look at all of these points, they have a velocity at that snapshot of time, right? And it's the sum of this velocity, the velocity of the center, and whatever the omega cross r term is here. Um, and I, that's not omega over r. Sorry. Right. And do you agree that this would, the one at the very top would be 2v, and that this one would be 0? OK, we all agree on that. Snapshot in time. And <clears throat> each of these points are fixed on the disk. So at a new snapshot in time, they're going to be shifted. Right, a little bit over. 7 might come here, 6 here, 5 here, 4, 1. Right, so we'll call this 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime, 4 prime, 5 prime, 6 prime, 7 prime. OK, and that's at time 2. Those points came there. And as time advances, each one of these points will, at some point in time, be right there. Right? So every one of these points will pass through this point, this contact point. And at that snapshot in time, the velocity of each one of these points will, will be what? Zero. So if I say then that let's put a point, a fictitious point, that's always right here at the contact point. But it happens to be the point that's fixed on the disk. Okay. So at one point in time, it's 1. Another point in time, it's two, three, four, whatever. Do you agree that I can say that um, the velocity of point, call it S again, the velocity of point S which is a point fixed in D, just like one, two, three, four, five are, but it always, at any given snapshot in time, it's S always is at that location. 
that, and then that velocity of s is going to be always zero. Does it make sense now? Why q3 would be a have to be included as a coordinate there? Q3 dot. Q3 dot is a synonymous to omega in this in this example. And s is the exact same thing. It's just a point that happens to be located right here. And if I advance in time, one of the points fixed in the disk happens to be at that point. And I can tell you what the velocity of it is. That whatever point, ha whatever physical point that's a piece of that disk happens to be at this location at time t always will have a velocity of zero. Who doesn't, still doesn't get that? Anybody? So do you know, does it make sense why <clears throat> our position vector, the s, should include q3 now? And it should be a function of q3 dot. Did anybody uh, do that? So s equals p dot. Actually, what, did anybody did anybody do that correctly, or have a different way then to get get the s? What should it be? What point should I locate s from? O, I think O is a good choice. And then what should that vector be? I think my radius is R, I got erased back there. What's the vector from O to S? Minus R times E Z. Right? So we didn't use D because the, the D frame is rotating with respect to E Z, but it's always pointing down. So we get to we can use the E. E Z is always aligned with this line. And if we go negative E Z, we'll always be at that point that we're interested in. All right. So S dot position from O. Oh, yeah, sorry. That was a mistake because I'm getting excited. And uh, <clears throat> that's position from O. And then S dot position from M equals that. And then if I do S dot um, position from M dot DT in N, what did I do wrong there? Oh, I forgot. Um, Do I not have a Q? Did I ever do uh, D and A? Did I do D and E? Should be. D dot angular velocity in E. Q3 dot. Maybe I led you guys down a, a long goose chase there, and I'm confusing myself. Um, If I express S and B and D, but, I don't know how to but it doesn't. <clears throat> actually, I think I think I may have said wrongly that. Uh, what am I missing here? Let's. Uh, we're, we're already past the break. Let's take five minutes, and uh, I'll see if I can figure out where the heck I went in this path and, and, and uh, undo myself. But uh, I think we're. This is, this is correct, that we need to uh, go from O.
think what I'm, what did I screw up? I think it's a, I think what it is is that you have to do, we got to say that S are both in D, right? So I can go from O, we want the velocity in N or A, and they're both in D. So I'm missing something. Point O, oh, that's one problem. So first I've got to say that M dot velocity, set velocity, and N is going to be zero. I don't know. Let's take a break. Um, and I'll think about that non live and then uh, write tinyurl.com MA223 feedback if you want to ask questions about this. Ask me why I'm confusing you. And, uh, and come back at 11. Um, Many people are completely confused at this at this point. Yeah, I cut. I uh, I'll I'll correct myself. I told you I told you wrong.
No feedback? All right, so what I was, I, w I was incorrectly saying, something here, and um, Chris's definition, which was line 32 here on my, this input 32, is fine. <laughs> and um, this is also fine. What I was confusing in my mind is that I was trying to convince you that that position vector had to be a function of the coordinate, Q3. Right? And, it, and it doesn't. It's not. But the question that I sh should have been properly articulating was, should the velocity of point S be a function of Q3 dot? You say no, Gong? No? So I would argue that yes, it does there. How many people think that it has to be a function of Q3 dot? Okay, so, so that, that relates to right, what I was convincing you here of is that the velocity of S fixed in D in the whatever inertial frame here is has to be a function of omega, where omega is, is a synonymous to Q3 dot. So that was where I was messing up my uh, explanation. Okay, so either of these definitions is fine. We now have m to s, right? You just walk down here and you walk over there, right? And that's where it's always going to be. But the velocity of s isn't simply, I can't just do what I did before, which was s dot position from m dot dt in n, for example. This, this velocity is not the velocity of the point of interest. Right? There's another point at S that just travels around on the plane. Right? And that's the velocity of that point. Right? But if we want to know and form this motion constraint associated with the velocity of the point of D fi uh, of the point fixed in D, then that's not going to help us get there. Okay. So how do we get there? We've got the positions, so let's start to create velocities. M set velocity to what? And N. We'll just go all the way back to A. What should M be in A? Zero. All right, so we set that velocity as a starting point. P is a point of moving in this A182 A1, A1, plane. And um, it's, it's also moving in this in frame. What should, P, what should the velocity of P in A be? Any thoughts on that? P and A? Yep. That's all it would be. So we can either set it, um, or I think we could even use uh, this theory. We could say that P, and I can never remember what order these go in. Since the velocity is point with a one point theory, it's the other point frame you want the velocity and the end frame. So the other point would be M. Right? P is moving around in the end frame. So that's going to be that. And then we want to get the velocity in the A frame. Velocity of point P has not been defined in reference frame N. Is that not what I wanted to do? Or am I 
doing these in the wrong order. Outer frame, the frame we want this point's velocity to find in, and the intermediate frame of the calculation. Let's just set this one, since we know what it is. I'm confusing myself further. So, set the velocity in the A-frame is Q1 diff, and since it's only a function of T, I can leave T out, times in X. And then I'll print that velocity in A. So we got the velocity of P in A. And then <clears throat> what would be a good way to get the velocity of first Q? What, is, what would be the velocity of Q in A? Same thing. So we can just say Q, set velocity in A, Q and diff times NX. Okay. How about O? Would either of our velocity theorems be helpful to get O? point theorem, what point would I use to reference? P or Q, both are fixed in E, and O is not moving with respect to P or Q in E. So we can use the V2 point theory. So I can say O dot V2 point theory with respect to, I'll just do Q, we want the velocity in the A frame, and they're both in what frame? E frame. So that is the velocity of O. Okay. Take a minute and manually do the, the V2 point theorem and see if you get the same answer, right? So recall what that is and use the diff and dt commands as needed and, and explicitly calculate the v2-point theorem there and see if you get the same answer.
any suggestions on how to uh, manually calculate the V2 point theorem for this point? I want the velocity of O with respect to the reference frame A. What is the what's the first part of the V two point theorem? So we could pick out Q, for example, and get velocity of Q in what frame? A plus what? Both points are fixed in what frame? E. So if I say E, angular velocity, in what? A, and I can cross it with some vector. What is that vector? Q to O. O dot position from Q. Okay. Same thing. All right, so that's what the V2 point theory does. We know the velocity of Q in A. That's why we tell it Q with respect to the A frame. And then we need the angular velocity of E in A. And we cross that with the position from o, Q to O. All right, so V2 point theory. The last point here, S, can also be gotten with the V2 point theory. And it's critical that we do this step instead of formulating the velocity as, as, as we did before. Notice this S position from M, DT, and N doesn't contain Q3 dot. And I'm claiming that it needs to contain that. So fill out, fill out that one, uh, this V2 point theory, to ensure that you get a velocity of point S, which is a point fixed in D in the A reference frame, with respect to the A reference frame. How many people got this? One, two, three, four, five. So, what should it be? Can we hear from Stephen? Can you raise your hand. What did you What did you put? O comma A comma D. So both points are fixed in D, both O and S, and we want the velocity in the, in the A frame. All right, so now we get this velocity expression that has Q1 dot, Q2 dot, and Q3 dot. 
And that's, that's the correct expression for the velocity of a point S fixed in D in A. All right? I'm sorry for boogering up uh, the explanation earlier, but that's what we need to get to. And this point is critical because <clears throat> we said there's no slip. Right? We're saying that this velocity must equal zero. And so that implies that this velocity, and I'm going to call it, I'll just give it a name, V of S and A. Oops. V of S and A. If I um, now dot that with the e two the e y direction that says that s can't slip in this e two direction and then if I can get the rolling constraint no slip in the e one direction by dotting it with the e x vector v s in a dot e dot x right. So that gives me two scalar expressions here. Um, both of those expressions need to equate to 0. So to be clear about that, I could uh, just put it in one of these little EQ functions. I could say 0 V S V. E dot x, right? So this is this is where what we're forming here. These two constraint equations, and these are functions of q's and q dots, and they must be equal to zero um, for the velocity of that point. All right. So this is our no slip rolling constraints. We get two equations, right? So we had three generalized coordinates minus m constraints gives us how many degrees of freedom for this system? Motion constraints. Two. P equals M. Sorry, N minus M. And that's the number of degrees of freedom. So we only have one degree of freedom. If we slide Q1, that motion constraint um, completely constrains the angular motion of both the wheel and, and the uh, angular motion of the trailer. So we have one degree of freedom in the system. We might want to check, are these essential non-holonomic constraints? And if you recall, um, if a function, if these are not integrable, that, that, would, be, that would mean that they are essential non holonomic constraints. And we can check if they're not integrable by matching terms to the uh, derivative of some general function of f of all the q dots and the q's. So I'm going to write um, d f d q1 of the first term is zero, right? I'm sorry, is uh, SM cosine of Q2. So whatever term is linear, uh, the coefficient of Q1 dot will be the partial of F with respect to Q1. And then we also have the partial of F with respect to Q3. So DF DQ3 equals negative r, we just 
is match terms, and then df dq2 equals 0. There's no q dot 2 term. And then we can check whether these mixed partials um, equate. I'll use this equate thing again. If I do um, df dq1 diff q2, does that equal df dq2 diff q1? Oh, yeah. Notice that it says an integer. I can't, it doesn't have a diff, right? Because this, this actually just uh, gets recognized as a normal Python integer. But we want to, we're using SymPy objects, so you can convert this to a SymPy integer by a quick uh, command of S there. And just to show that off, if I do type of 0, it's a Python integer. And if I do type of sm.s of 0, I've got a special SymPy object. So that, that's something that will catch you sometimes. But I want to ensure I can take a different, from here I create a symbolic 0, essentially, that I can take a diff. And notice that that doesn't equate, right? You can also do this same thing for sm.eqdfdq2 diff q3 and dfdq3 diff q2. That one's fine. And there's one more. dfdq1 um, dot diff q3 comma dfdq3 dot diff q1. That one's fine. So that first constraint, we don't. This, these have mixed partials that match, but one of them doesn't match. Doesn't uh, commute. I'm sorry, Chris. So we went through an example where we had a tangent function as well as a cosine function. Well, we have yes. Most likely, yeah. I think you can you can make those readings. But if I had, um, if df dq3 happened to be, well, for this one, if uh, df dq2 happened to be sm cosine q2 or q1, then they would then they would work, right? So you can't just assume that I see a cosine or a tangent that, 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 that that's not going to happen. If you want to make sure, just just do that, you know. But yes, once you get comfortable with all these things, you can you can just you may recognize it before. All right. So this we found out that it's not integrable. Essential whole amount of constraint. You can do the same thing with um, that other that other one. So we we just checked the first one. This expression. You also have to check that expression. Potentially. All right. So that's how we we do that. Last thing. Um, we have uh, one. You could introduce a. Um, I'm going to say I'm going to int introduce this relationship. I'm going to say that uh, u1 is going to be equated to q1 diff, and I need to introduce some u's first. This is a dynamic symbols. They're functions of time. U1, U2, U3. So some generalized speeds. And here, I can define the relationship for one of them. I'm just going to say that U1 is defined as Q1 dot. Right? And then um, we know that 
we have three generalized speeds, but only one is independent because there's only one degree of freedom, and two are dependent. If I um, take one of, did I name these up here? Let's take one of our, take our constraint equations here. Just copy that and bring it down. I can, uh, there's a command that I can call, it's called uh, exact replace, is which that stands for. And if I replace uh, q1.diff colon u1, I can put that constraint, these two constraint equations in terms of u1. Right? And I'm going to name them too. I'm going to call this non holonomic constraint equation one. And non holonomic constraint equation two. Okay, and I'm going to call, I'm going to make the choice and say that U1 will be my um, independent speed. And I'm going to use the SymPy solve command. I'm going to pass it constraint equation 1, constraint equation 2, in a list. And then I'm going to say solve for Q1 diff and Q2 diff. I'm sorry, Q3 diff and Q2 diff. Those are the only two equations in there. So if I, if I do that, then I can see that um, Q2 and Q3 dot are functions then of this one independent generalized speed that I've chosen. And those are the relationships. Okay? So anytime I see these, I could replace it with this new definition because due to the motion constraint that we have. Okay. I'm done. I'm over one minute over time here. Um, sorry that was a bit confusing there earlier, but uh, this is a yeah critical thing to try to get your head wrapped around. And if we need to go over it in a different way, we can. And um, I will see you all next time. And I have office hours. Office hours tomorrow.